good. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was actually a, a good invitation in the, for, in the sense that it, uh, it forced me to think about what on earth are we doing uh, in the research uh, department at the fund and uh, what is it that we should be doing. Uh, so I thank you for the opportunity to having to put my thoughts uh, to, uh, to paper or to slides. Uh, let me start with uh, a definition uh, and a boring definition. I think the, what comes after is the interesting part. Uh, what is it that the research department has to do at the fund? Well, basically it's to provide uh, state-of-the-art advice on macroeconomic policy for both bilateral surveillance, uh, which is Article 4's programs, and multilateral surveillance, which is the view of the world and the interconnections uh, between the various countries. I think that's the formal mandate. Uh, the interesting question is, well, what does it mean in practice? So I'm, I'm going to have uh, four slides uh, looking at various aspects. So I, I tried to think of in terms of uh, you know, what, what is different about the research department at the fund and, and some uh, academic uh, department. Uh, and uh, so I thought in terms of various types of comparative advantage. So if, if you think about academia, uh, you know, what you're supposed to do uh, as a researcher in an economics department is uh, analytical rather than synthetic. You're not in charge of taking into account all the aspects of the world, but just focus on one aspect, one distortion, work on it for a year, two years, and then understand the effect of a distortion either conceptually uh, or, 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 or empirically. And that's exactly what the division of labor uh, should be. Uh, the next aspect of academic research uh, is that it is uh, to some extent driven uh, by internal logic. So and so did this, I don't quite agree with the way he or she did it, let me change something, let me go to the next step, let me introduce something. Uh, I think that's also part of what good science is, uh, whether we have the right mix of, uh, of uh, research driven by internal logic or external uh, reality, I think can be discussed, but that's not the, uh, the topic of the day, so I'll just mention it. And then the third, which I think is specific to, to macro and maybe becoming less true over time, but surely still fairly clearly uh, true relative to other fields, is that there is too little uh, uh, applied work in macro. Uh, there's a lot of uh, conceptual work, but not quite enough of uh, empirical work corresponding to it. So, this is for academia. What about the IMF? Well, uh, we have no choice. We have to do applied work. We have basically have to understand what's going on uh, in each country of the world and uh, in, in the world as a whole. The, we have, I think, two comparative advantages. The first one, is we have access to a gigantic information set. Um, both data and then country experiences, given that for many years now we have looked at each country and written something about it, and we've had a very large number of programs. And that's really an incredible, uh, I wouldn't say data set, but fact set, that uh, constantly forces us to see whether something we think might be true actually historically is true or not. And then the third is proximity to uh, policy makers and policy so that we know what the questions they are dealing with, uh, what is on their mind, what they need the answer to, much more, I think, than people who are a, a bit further away from the action. So if you think of it this way, then the niche that the IMF research department, uh, or research in general, <coughs> has is fairly clear. The first one is full of theoretical developments, and we basically have to know what it is done uh, conceptually and empirically uh, in academia. Uh, I use follow. Follow is a bit strong. I think occasionally we can contribute to it, but it's clear that much of the state of the arts research at the analytical level is still going to happen outside of a fund, and that's the way it should be. The second, I think, is where we basically spend our days doing something quite different from uh, what say I was doing at MIT before what people do in, uh, in, academic, in, in economics departments, which is synthesize. And that's just not doing a literature review, uh, looking at the 200 articles which have looked at multipliers and making lists. It's, it's something much, much deeper and much more interesting, which is that what the world has is typically when you look at any particular issue, there's not one distortion 
these three, four, five distortions which are relevant. Now, what academia has done is basically deal with each of the distortions one at a time, but I don't have that choice. Basically, when I, when I think about capital controls and I go back to Rex's discussion this morning, I have to say what are the three or four distortions which are essential, and then try to put them together and then see what the policy implications are. And that's something which is not going to be done in academia because if you do this, it's going to be relatively messy uh, and you're not going to be published in a good journal. But that's what we need. And I think that's, that's an activity which is very different. Uh, the next is when we think something might be true, uh, we have this obligation and this possibility of using you know, the full information set, looking at all the countries where something like this has happened, what actually, is happen what, what actually uh, uh, came out. And I think that that's, again, uh, both an enormous advantage and an intellectual uh, obligation that we have. And then the last one is <coughs> we, in the end, have to present our conclusions in a way which we can sell to policymakers. And that, again, is an exercise which is not a standard academic exercise, but you have to say, yes, there are 16 effects, but I think these three are really the important ones. These are the ones you focus on. These are the ones that, uh, that you should uh, uh, organize policy uh, around. And, and again, this is not taught in graduate school. It's required over time. It's essential, and that's, I think, part of what we, uh, we do. Second uh, comparative advantage, if I look at the IMF versus uh, national authorities, I mean, every country has teams you know, in the research department at the bank, uh, sometimes at the Ministry of Finance, not very often, uh, which looks at the world. And so what is it that we can do that, that they cannot or they, they do not naturally do? Uh, and I think that it's absolutely obvious, which is that we have to look at the whole world. We can't be completely about Germany or France. We have to look, and there are enormous interactions between countries, uh, trade uh, for a very long time and financial uh, increasingly, so that we have to look at the world as a whole, and that's something that I think no organization uh, else than us uh, can do. I think the World Bank does it at the lower frequency, the OECD does it for a small set of countries, but we're the only organization which can do it for the 190 uh, members that we, that we have. And in that respect, uh, something I found fascinating is, is the, the uh, production of this uh, uh, document, which is called the World Economic Outlook, which comes in full form twice a year, and then in update form uh, two other times, or so four times a year. And Formally, what this is, is the set of forecasts, which is what the journalists care about, uh, with an explanation of how we came to, uh, to this forecast and what policies we think should be taken. And what's interesting here is that I think it's a very successful product in the sense that, to a large extent, uh, it is read by the people we want uh, to read it. Uh, but what's fascinating is the process for which it actually is created. It's in effect, what it does is it aggregates information. It's an information aggregator. Twice a year, we collectively within the fund, which is the desks for each country, the research department, uh, have to agree on what's going on. And so the very process of trying to create forecasts, argue about the forecast, argue about the forces behind the forecast is a process of interaction both of exchanging information about what's actually happening in the country, but also of uh, how we see fiscal policy. Does, how does it work? How does it work in country X? How does it work in country Y? And so this process is really a way for the whole building to come to a consensus, not just on the forecasts, which is kind of the emerged part of the iceberg, but on the way we think about fiscal policy or monetary policy or capital controls. Um, and that's, uh, that's an extremely interesting process, which can only take place uh, in an institution like the IMF and be uh, led by, by the research department. <coughs> Let me get to, to the last uh, point, which is, uh, the issue of internal organization, 
which is the role of a research department uh, within the IMF. I, first, I should say, a lot of the research is done not just in the research department, but is done in the area departments and the other functional departments. People continue to do research, uh, but I'm going to think about uh, what the research department does. So, let me start again with a fairly obvious statement, which is uh, our job is to provide, uh, disseminate uh, wisdom and, and techniques. Okay, so we have to develop tools uh, for bilateral surveillance, for multilateral surveillance, and there's, I just gave you a, a list of, of tools that you may or may not have heard of. Measures of vulnerability that can be used by a, a desk to actually assess uh, the degree of risk in a country. Early warning models, trying to see for a country or for the world as a whole what might go wrong. Uh, exchange rate assessments, what does it mean for, is the exchange rate overvalued, undervalued, what does it mean? How do you actually do it in practice? How do you come to a number and what are the limitations? And that's a very big part of what we do. Um, have, in the end, uh, the products have to be such that the people at the border, the people who, you know, at the desks or the people in the field have tools that they can use to assess the country. And academic research constantly provides new ideas and we have to translate that into tools which can be used. Now, the other more uh, controversial dimension uh, is that I think it's absolutely essential uh, for the research department to question uh, conventional wisdom. And in an organization like the IMF, in which we give advice to countries or we have programs with countries, it's essential that there be consistency in the advice we give to Algeria on one hand and Morocco on the other. We can't have a team saying fiscal policy is great and another team saying fiscal policy never used. So we need consistency. Uh, and that's one dimension. Uh, and it leads to having in the end, a very inertial set of beliefs. Uh, if you can let each team go and do their own thing, then clearly there's going to be creativity and it's going to move, and, but it's going to be chaotic. But the constraint that we have to have an internal, at least, uh, IMF view about various things means that left to itself, once this view has been adopted, people are very reluctant to move and it moves more slowly than it should uh, in, in an ideal uh, world. And I think there, uh, the research department has to be the one which constantly question whether the old wisdom is still right or the world has changed or the old wisdom was wrong and, and moves things on. And here, that's, I wouldn't call this a fight, but it is an intellectual fight in which you have to move the, this enormous super tanker uh, and uh, not just by saying, well, this is the way the world is, but by convincing people that that's a, that's a big part of what we do. Um, so I think there's a natural niche for uh, a research department in an organization like this, which is, uh, I've used the word intellectual irritant. I just received an email from my team saying, that's too strong. But <laughs> that's ty typical email from the phone. Uh, uh, but uh, that, that's what it is. I mean, you basically, you know, People have these views that they've had for many years, and now you say, well, you should think again. And they don't like the idea of thinking again in that case. I mean, they are happy with the old views, but I think, I think the word is fine. And, and how do you do this? What I've learned is, again, it's not just good enough to be right. You have to convince everybody uh, all the time, and, and you have all the way down to the people in the field. So what we do in practice is, uh, and this is very concrete, uh, we have high frequency notes, <laughs> so more or less every week when there are issues which are hot, uh, then we try to take one step back analytically and write a short note on how economic theory uh, uh, sheds light on, on what's going on. Then we have lower frequency notes, which, you know, at the front, a low frequency note is something which would take three months. Uh, in, 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 in a department would take three years. Uh, but these are things in which there is a lot of work, more work to be done, we take the time and then we sell it again. And the question of selling it is very important. Then what uh, had been created by my predecessor, but I have uh, amplified, is interdepartmental discussions, uh, free-for-alls uh, every week in which we actually discuss the issues of the week. 
uh, we discuss one or two additional issues, and it's non-hierarchical and it's very frank. And that's where slowly uh, you move you move minds. Uh, and then you actually have to make sure that it go, again goes all the way. And when the team goes to some country, uh, they 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 you know they they go with what you'd like them to go. Uh, and again, all that dimension is is not what an academic department is about. Last slide, but this is this is an open one. So I've described, I think, what we do and what we should do. Um, how successful we are, I think that's not for me to say. But you know, I've I've, I've put a partial list, and partial here is a pun. I mean, both uh, my biased view and, and and surely not the complete list. Uh, but I think on three topics, uh, we've made a difference to the way the, the fund has fought uh, since the beginning of the crisis. On fiscal policy, um, we've made two calls. Uh, I think the first one is very controversial, exposed. I still would stick with it, which is the fiscal expansion of 2009, saying that basically given that monetary policy was stuck, it was essential uh, to actually have a fiscal stimulus. And I still think that was the right call, but anyway, that's the call we made. Uh, and uh, the, in the more recent past, I think we've made two important contributions, which is the one is not too fast, not, not too slow in terms of fiscal consolidation to try to avoid the kind of extreme fiscal consolidations which we were seeing happening in some uh, European countries. Uh, and then on multipliers, and, and I think we've uh, fought, and I think rightly so, the notion that uh, you know, fiscal policy can be expansionary in the context uh, in which we are. But basically, we have to accept the fact that fiscal consolidation is needed, but it is going to decrease demand, it is going to decrease output, and that has to be taken into account. On capital controls, uh, Rex has given, yeah, Rex has given uh, a very nice talk. I mean, I think we've moved uh, the view of the fund. Of, the fund has moved, and partly because of us. And then the last one is uh, with the work we've done on exchange rates. Might have other items, and you might think that we've done something wrong, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.